Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this IT governance webinar on responding to a data breach. My name is Aaron Corder. I'm the founder and executive chairman of IT Governance Limited, and I'm here because uh, in the 20 years since I set up IT Governance, we've helped a lot of organizations prepare for and deal with uh, data breaches of one sort or another, and typically we work to help them get to the point where they are able to uh, avoid a data breach as well as being able to respond to it if and when it does occur. Uh, we as a company are a single source provider of solutions for organizations dealing with the wide range of cybersecurity and IT governance challenges. Uh, privacy management has become a particular area of expertise for us over the last two and a half years since the advent of the General Data Protection Regulation. And of course, it's the General Data Protection Regulation that brings to all organizations enhanced uh, challenges in terms of dealing with uh, data breaches. As an organization, so cyber resilience has become, uh, if you like, the umbrella which describes all of the activities that we do around data protection, privacy, cybersecurity, PCI, incident response, business continuity, and we deliver our services through a combination of public and distance learning training courses, online staff awareness. We have a very active and uh, substantial consultancy team which operates on a global basis. We have a suite of software tools. And of course, in our publishing business, we have books and documentation toolkits, some or all of which you can draw on in order to uh, effectively tackle your both governance risk management compliance, but more particularly your data breach resilience challenges. Today's webinar is designed to run for about 50 or 55 minutes. That's me talking to you. You'll notice that you're all on uh, silent mode. Uh, that's to try and avoid the range of background noises and so on that sometimes can disrupt uh, webinars. Um, when I'm finished going through the prepared material, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. In fact, you can ask questions as I go through the material. So in the GoToWebinar panel that you should have uh, in the screen in front of you, there will be a, there is a bar marked questions. If you click on that, it'll open up a panel where you can type in questions. Please do feel free to type in questions as and when you have them as we go through the webinar. And um, we will, uh, once we come to the Q&A section, what I'll do is I will uh, open up those questions and I'll share the questions with you. I'll read the question out so everybody knows what the question was. Uh, and then I will, uh, I'll tell you the answer to, to the question. So please do, if you have questions, ask them as we go along. Or of course, you can ask them when we come to the end. So today we're going to be talking about why most organizations are unprepared for a data breach, what they can or could do about it. The headlines are every day full of, an organize, full of reports of organizations who uh, suddenly discover that they've had 100,000 or 500,000 or several millions or tens of millions uh, sets of personal data about their customers uh, stolen. Uh, and they're often very surprised and shocked. Uh, and they're often uh, unable to explain how come the breach appears to have been in place for, uh, for a number of years, not just something that happened yesterday. So we've seen organizations like uh, British Airways uh, breached. We've seen organizations recently like Uber um, and uh, some credit management companies uh, getting fines from uh, the Information Commissioner and from data supervisor authorities elsewhere in the European Union for breaches of the Data Protection Act uh, that preceded GDPR. Um, and in the European Union, we've even seen the first fines for breaches of the General Data Protection Regulation. So why are most organizations unprepared to deal with the data breach, given that GDPR has been a law since the 25th of May, and one of the key issues that GDPR is addressing is the preparedness of organizations to deal with data breaches. We can look at the essential ingredients of a cyber, a cyber incident response management program and the 12 core requirements of the UK's ICO uh, that you have to deal with when reporting a data breach. The GDPR, as you're probably aware, has a mandatory, mandatory requirement that data breaches where there is a risk to the rights and freedoms of data subjects 
is reported to the ICO within 72 hours of it being first identified. So what do you have to explain to the ICO when you report a data breach? What the best practice approaches are to protecting your data in today's uh, much more heightened data protection or privacy era, and the steps you should take now to help you respond to and recover from a breach as quickly as possible. The key thing to think about, key thing to know about breaches is that you're going to be breached. Every organization is going to suffer a data breach sooner or later. It's going to be uh, on a regular basis, you're not going to get through multiple years without a data breach of any sort, bearing in mind that data breaches uh, are caused by outside attackers as well as internal uh, error. The range of uh, events, the range of attacks, the range of occurrences that can lead to a data breach are very, very substantial. Most organizations, uh, in fact, uh, don't know how many times they've been attacked. Uh, the data says more than a quarter. Uh, the reality tends to be very substantially more than a quarter. Don't know whether they've ever had a breach or not because they have no mechanism for detecting a breach. And if you've got no mechanism for detecting a breach, how would you know? You can't expect a data breach to be something which uh, always manifests itself in the form of a locked uh, workstation screen or a server which is out of commission. Many data breaches are highly surreptitious, um, are very advanced and are designed to uh, hide out in corners of your internet collecting and exfiltrating valuable data over an extended period of time. So if you don't know uh, whether you've been breached, you've got no idea how many times you've been breached, it's because you don't have a mechanism for finding out. And of course, the likelihood of being breached goes up week by week. Attackers are spending more on attack software than we're spending on defense. Uh, attackers have more and more affiliates, uh, more and more uh, in the ecosystem of uh, attack capability than we have in the defense capability. Most of the legitimate businesses are still blissfully blind to the reality of uh, cyber attack, and that makes the life of a rapidly proliferating cyber uh, cyber attack ecosystem, uh, very interesting for the attackers. One in four organizations will undoubtedly suffer a breach in the next two years. That's a breach which they're aware of, which is significant, which they'll have to uh, report. Four of the five top causes of data breaches are because of human or process error, not because of a sophisticated cyber attack, but because a human being decides to do something which turns out to be a data breach. So Morrison's is a case that you may have read about, large uh, supermarket uh, facing a class action lawsuit because a senior internal auditor uh, got uh, um, irritated with his employer and after he left uh, released a USB stick full of personal data onto the internet. He'd stolen the USB stick full of data in the course of his duty as a result of which Morrison's was found vicariously liable for the data breach even though the internal auditor had carried out and committed a criminal act for which he's now in prison um, and Morrison's is therefore facing a very significant uh, potential award against them, certainly dealing with significant legal costs and trying to defend the case. So process error, 43% of businesses experienced a cybersecurity breach or attack in the past 12 months. Only 27% of businesses have a formal cybersecurity policy. And that's interestingly not dissimilar from what the data suggests is the number of organizations which are genuinely compliant with the requirements of GDPR right now. It's somewhere between 20 and 25%. So most organizations are not ready, they're going to be breached, and the terrifying thing about being breached is that on average, the gap between when the breach occurs and when it's discovered is about 197 days. What's even more terrifying is mostly that discovery is by a third party, not by the organization that's been breached. So most organizations are in a parlous state where cybersecurity is concerned. The certainty of Having been breached is, the likelihood of having been breached is high. Uh, the certainty of being breached in the future uh, is, has to be considered. The leading causes of breaches, and so uh, we're looking at uh, very recent uh, data, 1819 data, is a phishing attack. Uh, phishing attacks are 
more and more sophisticated, the quality of the email more and more uh, likely to deceive. Phishing attacks which originate inside the network of a supplier, highly guaranteed to succeed. Most organizations don't train staff to spot phishing attacks. Training staff to spot a phishing email should be one of the standard things that all organizations do, given that phishing is one of the leading types of breaches. Unauthorized access is the second uh, most likely cause of breaches. It's uh, the cause of slightly less than 50%, sorry, about half as many breaches are caused by unauthorized access as by phishing emails. Unauthorized access includes people being able to uh, get into software they shouldn't be able to get to, being able to spoof or copy someone's username or password uh, access that's not authorized. Malware is the third most common, ransomware the fourth most common type of breaches. Ransomware you might think of as a form of uh, malware, uh, but ransomware typically is uh, downloaded sometimes through a phishing email, but uh, mostly through uh, somebody clicking on a link they shouldn't click on or going to a website that's been infested or going somewhere that they shouldn't be and not paying attention uh, and downloading a piece of software, which then typically will call in uh, through a command and control center or something else, a piece of uh, uh, ransomware, which will encrypt the device and perhaps a number of other devices. And the only way that you can get yourself free is by paying the attacker money. And weirdly, it turns out that if you pay to get free, you'll be attacked again. If you don't pay, typically you'll have your data destroyed. So unless you're prepared for it, you're between a rock and a hard place. So if you have a breach, uh, what do you need to do? Bearing in mind, of course, the breaches do include um, accidental breaches, breaches carried out by people deleting a file or a drive by mistake. The definition of a personal data breach under the GDPR is a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of, or access to personal data transmitted, stored, or otherwise processed. So if a piece of malware gets onto a network and it makes the system inoperative as a result of which data which was collected in order to carry out, let us say, a series of operations on hundreds of people over a weekend, that data is not available and therefore the operations have to be cancelled. That is a data breach. The fact that the criminals have not been able to exfiltrate the data and sell it or use it elsewhere doesn't change the fact that it's a data breach. Under GDPR, it's a, uh, a non-availability uh, of data data, it's been, um, uh, access has been prevented, uh, and it's been done so in a way which uh, goes against the reason for why the data was collected. It's a breach. And where there is a breach, data controllers and data processors have obligations. A data processor is the entity which is processing data under a contract from a data controller. So data controllers collect data. They determine the means of processing and the purpose of processing data. They're the interface with the customer. Typically, controllers will also be processing the data. The distinction that we used to think of under the old Data Protection Act of um, are you a controller or are you a processor or are you both uh, doesn't really apply. A controller is defined as the entity which determines the means and purposes of processing and a processor is a third party to whom a controller has outsourced the processing of some of that data. So if none of the processing is outsourced, by definition, the controller is the only entity which is going to have any liability or obligation in respect to the processing of that data. If it's outsourced some of it, the processor has to have a data processing agreement with the controller. It's not allowed to process data in the absence of such an agreement. And that agreement has to set out what the arrangements are for, amongst other things, reporting data breaches. The law requires that any data breach, however minor, is reported by a processor to the controller. So that would suggest that controllers should put in place a standardized reporting process, which makes it easy for any of their supply chain that might have data of theirs that they're processing to know to whom a breach should be reported. So all breaches have to be reported within 72 hours of first discovering it uh, to the controller. The controller then has a choice. 
the controller is not obligated to report every breach to the information commissioner. If it's a breach that's unlikely to cause harm to or, or compromise the rights and freedoms of data subjects, then it doesn't have to report the breach. If it's likely to create a risk, then it must report the data breach to the supervisory authority. If it's likely to create a high risk, then it's got to tell the data subjects as well as the supervisory authority. GDPR does leave it up to the controller to determine what the levels of risk are. There is guidance commonly available, but frankly, it's up to the controller. And it's worthwhile bearing in mind that what the controller might think of as being a risk which it will accept in respect of its own assets, uh, it might not be a level of risk that the data subjects would accept. So it's quite possible that you could have two different approaches to risk living alongside one another. There's the approach to risk, which you might be very entrepreneurial, aggressive business, where you're prepared to take large risks with your own assets. But if you're collecting personal data, you probably want to have a different set of risk assessment criteria in relation to that data. So you might very well be saying to yourself that where personal data is concerned, high risk is something which is going to distress the data subjects, irrespective of whether we care about that or not. If they care, therefore it's a high risk. And high risk broadly is something which is going to have a significant impact on the rights and freedoms of data subjects, might lead to um, intrusive use of their data, could lead to identity theft, could lead to any one of a number of possible outcomes. As I said, where there is a high risk, you have to report the data breach to the data subjects as well as the supervisory authority. 72 hours is the period within which you've got to report it, and that's 72 calendar hours, not 72 business hours. So if the breach occurs on Friday morning and you discover it, as hopefully you will, on Friday morning, you're reporting it on Monday. And the fact that it's a weekend doesn't remove from you the obligation to deal with the breach and report it in time. And when you think about it, that's only right. Data subjects uh, live in calendar time, not business time, and anything which is going to affect their freedoms uh, should be something which they're notified of as soon as possible so that they can deal with that risk. Now, the reality is that sometimes when you discover a breach, it's quite complex. You don't know a lot about it. It will take some time before you can uh, uh, fully report it. Um, there is the option for you to uh, report that over time, uh, but you do have to make the initial report within the first 72 hours and explain why it is that you're going to need a bit of time to uh, provide the additional uh, data. So reporting, critical. There is a specific fine reserved under GDPR for failures to report data breaches within the time period. Uh, uh, Uber has already been subject to uh, just such a fine as has an organization in Austria, failure to report a data breach within the time period is on its own a very specific uh, finable offense. So when reporting a breach, what do you have to say to the ICO? And I'm going to focus here specifically on the UK's information commissioner. Um, you're going to fill in a standard questionnaire. If you have a data protection officer uh, with a bit of luck, they have experience. If you're using a, an outsourced DPO service, they will certainly have experience. But what the questionnaire is attending to, uh, what the questionnaire is intending to find out is, do you have a breach response plan in place? Or are you just making this up as you go along? Do you know how much personal data you're processing? And are you aware of any special categories of data that this might include? So this is looking um, very specifically uh, at your compliance with Article 30 of GDPR, the requirements to map your data flows, identify what categories of data you've got. Uh, question three, can you identify how many data records may be affected the nature of that data? It's questioning, not only do you know where the data is, but how much you've got, how well you control uh, the data, um, and what the particular type of data is specifically. Question four is asking about your planning. Uh, are you aware of the breach risks that you are running? Are you aware of what vulnerabilities you had? Have you thought through what type of impact both on the organization and on the data subject there might be if there were a breach? How long would it take your organization to restore critical functions following a breach? Remember, one of the rights 
effectively of a data subject is that not only do they have a right to uh, their data being processed in accordance with what you've told them you're going to do, but they have a right to the systems within which it's being processed being secure and adequate. So do the staff involved in processing the personal data, have they had data protection training at least every two years? Are staff aware of the reporting procedure to follow if they suspect or even if they if they are aware of even suspect a data security incident if they're not aware of how to report it they're not going to report it um, and given that you are supposed to be reporting a breach within 72 hours of discovering it and that what you'll be trying to do when you report a breach is demonstrating how negligent you were not uh, you want to be able to say that yes our staff have been trained we have an internal incident response and data breach reporting process we also follow security best practice we uh, we have something where we have an external audit uh, as is provided for under cyber essentials pci dss or iso 27001 um, and that means that we can demonstrate that we have not only set out to apply best practice where information security is concerned but we've got external validation of our success in doing that do we have specific measures in place to address breaches uh, when they occur in order to limit damage so if you have ransomware what do you do if somebody contacts help desk preferably by telephone and says i think i've got some ransomware on my device what happens next how quickly is that ransomware able to spread across the network or have you segregated devices or do you have a policy of immediately disconnecting and uh, removing devices from the network how do you address data breaches that occur to limit further damage can you meet the deadline for reporting data breaches do you have somebody who over a weekend or um, when a breach occurs is going to be in a position to determine what should happen do you have access to uh, legal guidance as to how you should handle reporting a breach because bear in mind that reporting a breach is just the first of a set of steps which may lead to uh, significant fines arising from a post breach investigation by the ICO which identifies significant uh, vulnerabilities weaknesses inside your organization's GDPR approach which might amount to substantial negligence so can you meet the deadline do you have the resources and processes in place to handle it how are you going to communicate with data subjects as well as internally as well as with customers as well as with all the people that you want to go on dealing with you in spite of the fact that you've had a breach and much evidence suggests that organizations once they've admitted a breach face uh, drop-offs in uh, revenue in profit uh, and in cash flow how are you going to communicate what's happened and of course do you have somebody who's responsible for managing data protection or privacy inside the organization do you have a dpo uh, do you have an assigned data protection manager somebody who is going to be able to oversee the whole breach reporting process and who can much more than that make sure that as an organization you're genuinely compliant with the requirements uh, around gdpr so how do you deal with the data breach talked a bit about why you should be addressing it and the challenges in meeting the ICO's response uh, period there are six steps to follow from uh, from our experience the kind of reality that our clients go through we need to uh, identify what happened uh, what was the initial damage the situational uh, analysis how did it affect our organization what went wrong what caused it how did it happen uh, we need to try and pull that information together as quickly as possible so having a set of standardized documents uh, that identify what information you should gather having people trained in asking the questions what happened how did we know uh, as the first steps in the incidents are beginning to emerge identifying what data has been affected is a really important next step how many records were affected it's interesting to see that organizations like British Airways uh, first came out and said we had 380,000 records compromised and then came out a few weeks later and said um no it turns out to have been something more like half a million records really you want to be able to get this stuff right from the beginning your own internal records of what data you're processing your uh, controls around volumes of data you're processing you want to track as much of that as you can so that when there is a breach you can very quickly identify what data is at risk what's going to be the impact on the parties concerned so again if you're British Airways you need to very quickly recognize that the fact that uh, attackers have been able to get hold not only of people's 
payment card data in some instances, but much more importantly, names, addresses, and the dates during which they were away from home on holiday might expose all of those addresses to the possibility of uh, physical attack. Understanding that, working out therefore how to uh, uh, help the data subjects work out what to do is a very important part of preparing to handle a breach. Are staff properly trained? This is about not just staff trained in handling the breach, but are staff also trained in, uh, uh, in general data protection activity? Are they trained in how to do the things that will help them avoid being the cause of or contributing to a breach? What preventive measures has the organization taken? What preventive measures has it planned to take when a breach of this size occurs so that it can deploy those measures very quickly? Uh, that might include um, forensic investigation uh, as part of the steps that you wheel out within a matter of hours of a breach occurring. It might include isolation of affected systems. It might include a lockdown on databases that have been breached. Um, a number of steps that you could take, you might need expert help to determine what they are, but there are a number of things you can pre-prepare uh, to ensure that you deal with the breach effectively. But there are also all of the things that you could have done in order to reduce the likelihood of the breach in the first place. And when you're thinking about preventive measures, you want to be thinking about preventive measures across a continuum, starting with the point at which the data was collected all the way through to the point at which it was accessed and exfiltrated. And of course, what about governance and supervision, oversight? Supervisory authorities will want to know the name of the data protection officer or the person responsible for data protection in the breached organization. Quite a good idea to have determined in advance who that is, made sure the person's had appropriate training. You don't want it to be Buggins' turn. You've got a breach to report and you say to the quality manager, I think it'll be you today because the quality manager can say, well, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and that's not going to go well when you're arguing how you weren't negligent. So a number of logical steps to take in dealing with data breaches. But it goes back to incident response management. Even before you think about data protection, privacy compliance, you should have been thinking about incident response. Because managing and responding to unexpected disruptive events that, uh, that occur by definition without you planning for them, but which will impact the organization is something all organizations should do naturally. Risk management says you should be working out how to control impacts from unexpected events to an acceptable level. Impacts can partially be controlled through, for instance, uh, insurance, but the impact of a data breach is got to be controlled through uh, how you make sure that you lock down after the breach, how you inform data subjects who are affected. So the ability to detect, to react to, and respond to security incidents in a fast, planned, and coordinated fashion is one key aspect of how cyber resilient an organization is. And we'll see over the next five to seven years, cyber resilience becoming more and more of an area on which organizations focus their cybersecurity activity. In other words, recognizing the certainty of a breach, you need to have defense in depth. You need to be able to deal with a, uh, an incident as it goes through your layers of defense and you need to be able to respond in an agile way, way to it. You can't prevent the inevitable from happening, but you can have an effective response which minimizes the impact when it does happen. And as we've seen, uh, uh, incidents can be technical. They can be a software failure. They can be a hardware failure. They can be an outside attack, which is a focused cyber attack. They can be a random cyber attack looking for a particular vulnerability, which you failed to deal with. It could be a denial of service attack. It could be the result of mistakes, accidents. All of those things can cause system outages. All of those things should be reflected in your incident response planning. So you should be thinking not only from a GDPR compliance point of view, but from a broader corporate risk management perspective about incident reporting best practice. I mean, organizations should really have measures in place to deal with that. Uh, if you're a listed company, part of your risk management process should be incident management, your public sector organization, an organization of any size, you're going to be dealing with incidents. So it should be just start, standard part of 
good, sensible, shrewd risk management. Your instrument, re instrument response plans should include the appointment of a responsible person. And that might be reporting to a data protection officer. It might be reporting to a senior incident response officer. But there needs to be somebody who owns how your incident response works, uh, who's accountable for it, and who's accountable for ensuring that all of your compliance objectives, as well as your broader risk management objectives, are met both through the planning, but more particularly through the activity of responding to and handling a data breach. You really can't manage data breaches without knowing where data is stored. The data flow mapping requirement of GDPR is really a uh, compliance reflection of a much broader need for all organizations. You need to know where your data is. The number of times an organization is breached because it left a complete file of data on a decommissioned server and that server was not updated and so software wasn't updated so an attacker was able to gain access to it. The organization didn't know where its data was. You have to know where your data is you have to know as you move systems and amend systems in what can quite often be a fast changing environment. You have to know where data is because if you don't, you can't ensure that it's being properly protected. You have to have good internal communication mechanisms. So the department that owns the data that's been breached needs to know how to communicate that to the incident response team. That needs to be able to, between them, escalate where necessary, but you need to be able to have a well thought out, well tested, well communicated set of activities that deliver a smooth response in terms of the incident. And that can only happen if your plans are tested and audited. It's no good just sitting down and writing up an incident response plan because when it happens, nobody's going to go and find the plan, read it and go, okay, step one says I must do this, step two says I must do that. Does anybody know where the password is for the system that I'm supposed to use? I don't even have it on my laptop. You can't do that. You've got to make sure that what's written down is something people know how to follow. So you need to train them. You need to audit people's compliance with those processes to make sure that in extremis, it's going to work as you've planned it to do. And of course, doing that, it means that you're going to improve the plan because by testing and auditing it, you're going to identify and flush out weaknesses or inadequacies that you can then deal with. So a good incident response plan should minimize the adverse effects of a breach, should guide the organization's response to breaches, should limit damage, and all of those things should mean the confidence that external stakeholders have in the organization should go up because recovery, while recovery time and costs of recovery go down. And so bear in mind the breach is inevitable. What you should be worrying about is how quickly can we get over it and get on with doing business. It's the organizations which don't have proper plans in place that suffer the most significant reputational damage and of course suffer the most significant damages in the way of fines because you've been negligent, haven't you? If you know that breaches are highly likely and you don't have a plan for dealing with them, I guess that falls into the overall area of negligence. According to PwC, only 30% of organizations have an incident response plan. 70% of organizations are leaving to chance their survival of a cyber attack. Given the frequency and virulence of cyber attacks, that's an awful lot of organizations that are at risk. And so as a cautious organization, you'd probably want to be thinking about your supply chain and you'd be wanting to ask organizations in your supply chain what they've done about cyber incident response. Are they going to be able to respond, particularly if they're processing your data? Do they know who they need to tell? After a breach, there really is a lot of pressure about a number of issues that you've got to deal, deal with, particularly if it's a large breach, particularly if a number of data subjects already know about it and has leaked to the press or online media. So you need to be able to deal with all of those issues. You need to know how to report it to insurance. You need to deploy your PR people. You need to manage social media fallout. You need to uh, be working out how to tell the data subjects themselves while you're still often trying to contain the breach, trying to work out what actually happened. So that's a lot of stuff going on and you need to be in a position to handle it. And that again comes back down to preparation. PwC found the average time it takes to detect a breach around 99 days, but the 72 hours only starts ticking after the breach discovery. 72 hours 
If you don't have an incident response plan to come up with one, uh, to be able to demonstrate that you weren't negligent uh, in an environment where uh, you're going to be breached. So good practice, have an incident response plan, test it, make sure it works. Key issues, of course, are how do you identify that you've had an incident? What does an incident really look like? When somebody has something happen on their device, how do they know it's not just a simple malfunction? Who do they report it to? If they've had training and they still click on something by mistake, are they going to hide it away because they don't want to get into trouble? How, as an organization, do you know you've had an incident? When somebody deletes a file, how do you know that's happened? How do you know whether or not staff are downloading copies of your customer file or your staff file onto a USB stick, which they're carrying around with them? How do you know when you've had a cybersecurity breach? What are the objectives of the, of the investigation and cleanup operation? How do you know when that activity is complete? How do you tick off the investigation is adequate? How do you tick off the cleanup is adequate? How do you know that it's safe to let people back into the system? Do you ever, do you take copies of uh, the system and put them away in a, a chain of evidence environment uh, and then restore from backup? What does that mean you lose if you restore from backup? Analyzing the information relating to the incident. You first got to gather the data, but getting yourself in a position where you can work out genuinely what happened. And that might often be different a week after than it was in the first hours of trying to deal with it. And it's that, that determining what's happening, what happened, identifying the systems, networks, and assets that have been compromised, that really is part of the, really is the most challenging part of managing a data breach. Because it's the, once you've determined what information has been disclosed, uh, you've then got to work out what they're doing with it. You've got to work out what the risk is to the data subjects. Uh, you've got to find out who did the breach and why, how they happened, how it happened. Was it a vulnerability? Was it an attack? If we were penetration tested in the recent year, um, was this vulnerability found? Was this something that we should have been testing more frequently? All of that is part of your investigation as to how it happened. What's the impact on the organization? Do we need to tell our cyber insurers? What's the impact on the data subjects? Do we need to tell the information commissioner? What kind of investigation do we need to mount with which forensics company who has what working protocols to investigate what happened and why? The, the, the information commission is not going to say you have to use the state of forensics company. They're expecting you to get on with investigating the breach because that's part of your obligation as a controller. If the breach is at a processor, you're still on the hook as a controller. The processor, yes, they're obliged to deal with the breach in the same way as are you, but as you're the controller, you're obliged to make sure that they are. So you have to be thinking about not just your own incident response plans, but how effective are the incident response plans of those of my data processors on whom I rely. So if you outsource payroll, for instance, that would be a classic example of an organization where you want to be really sure that you know how they're managing personal data. The reality is few organizations truly understand their state of readiness. They're not actually ready to respond to an incident. Incidents involve people, processes, and technology, and they don't have a proper handle on how those interact or even a proper understanding of where the vulnerabilities are in any of those. Most major incidents will, will, will require external professional expertise to resolve and deal with. In BA's case, we believe that the way they dealt with it was to fire their entire internal department and outsource it to, um, uh, to IBM or one of the other large managed security providers. Um, yes, it requires professional expertise. Whether or not that's the appropriate response, I don't know. Crest, who is the penetration testing uh, organization's professional body, says instant response management has a seven step process. First, you have to detect it. Then it has to be reported internally. It has to be investigated, which might require uh, external input, but certainly there's an investigation. And then you can carry out triage. So typically, most organizations will require anything that's out of the ordinary to be reported to help desk so that it's treated as though it is any other normal malfunction. 
And that means that you're not asking users to determine whether something is a malfunction or a security incident. You're just saying it's odd. It must be reported to the help desk. Help desk uh, investigate. They do the triage. They say, yes, this is a security incident. It goes to the security team who take action. That's phase five. Having dealt with it, contained it, uh, they can then roll out the recovery plan and then uh, follow up with further investigation uh, to, uh, to deal with the aftermath of the incident. So looking at that in a little bit more uh, detail, preparation, criticality assessment, which are our critical uh, systems, which what is our critical uh, data, carry out a cybersecurity threat analysis, looking at realistic scenarios and rehearsing how a threat might, might manifest itself. Looking at the implications of that threat on people, process technology and on information so that you can model uh, however imperfectly the, uh, the impacts. Create a control framework that's designed to reduce both the likelihood and the impact of those identified uh, threats and then from there, form a view about your overall state of readiness for cybersecurity incident response. So the whole of this phase is about uh, identifying what could damage you and making sure that you've taken sensible steps to put in place the controls that will limit the damage. Having done that, having uh, prepared and rehearsed your response plans, you now need to go into action. You need to be able to respond to incidents. You've got to be able to identify them. You've got to have a clearly defined set of objectives in each situation, find out what happened, what data has been compromised, uh, then find out how the event happened, uh, work out how to lock down the method of intrusion, make sure the threat doesn't spread. Whatever the objectives are, you've got to be clear about them. You've got to get to work uh, implementing them. Take the action that will enable you to do that. And having contained the attack, you can then look at how you recover systems, data, and connectivity to get your business back up to your uh, minimum uh, required level of operation. Then you can follow up. Follow up is the more thorough investigation. Once you've got systems working, um, you want to go and have a very deep dive into how the incident occurred. Uh, if you've isolated the data, that makes it easier. Uh, report the incident to relevant stakeholders, carry out a post-incident review of the what can we learn from what happened? What can we learn from our response? Uh, how do we build on those lessons learned? And some of that will flow through into your systems, processes, and controls. So you should update those, improve training, um, and you should also with all incidents, make them part of a trend analysis so that you can identify whether or not this is a one-off or whether there is an, a series of focused events which are designed to target you because you can put in place different strategies for dealing with uh, one-off ad hoc events um, that, that, that you might that you might put in place to deal with an escalating series of focused specific attacks on one or more individuals inside a firm. So how do you protect data? Under GDPR, well, um, GDPR is concerned that you protect the security of the data and of the systems within which it's uh, processed. And the requirement under GDPR is you should be able to demonstrate that you comply with the six data processing principles, the sixth of which is that processing data will be done securely. So an information security management system is typically a starting point. ISO IEC 27001 is the international standard that describes best practice for implementing an ISMS. And not surprisingly, under GDPR, demand for support implementing ISO 27001 is growing very, very quickly. An information security management system, ISMS, focuses on the broad range of confidential or sensitive information managed by an organization. It includes, by default, all personal data, um, and it makes sure that systematically the organization is managing threats to that data. And it's this systematic approach which relies on, again, people, process, and technology that helps organizations demonstrate they're complying with the security requirements of GDPR. I mentioned people, process, and technology a couple of times because they really are like three pillars of a stool. 
uh, you need properly trained people who understand what the formal process is for determining which ports on a firewall should be open and the firewall should be modern and up to date uh, so that it can't be hacked. And that combination of appropriately deployed technology supported by competent people working to an overall plan is at the heart of effective information security. But you've also got weaknesses, therefore, in any one of those. You can think of each one of those as being part of the attack surface. So weaknesses in technology, inadequate processes, inadequately trained people enable an attacker to uh, get into your system. Sitting alongside ISO 27001 might be the might be a PIMS, a personal information management system. And a PIMS is a standard just like ISO 27001, except it's still a British standard, which provides a framework for managing personal information. The 2017 version of the standard has been recently upgraded so that it complies with the requirements of GDPR. And the any organization that implements both BS 10,012 and ISO 27,001, perhaps supported by Cyber Essentials, has gone, we believe, a long way to being able to demonstrate has taken all appropriate steps to manage its uh, compliance requirements under GDPR. You can be audited while there isn't yet a formal uh, accredited certification scheme for BS 10,012. It can be tied into an existing ISO 27,001 certificate, um, as we know, because we got the world's first accredited uh, ISO 27,001 BS 10,012 uh, certificate uh, four or five months ago. That's the sensible way to go if you want to be able to demonstrate conclusively that you've taken appropriate externally validated action to deal with your compliance, your privacy compliance and information security requirements under the GDPR. The difference between an ISMS and a PIMS are relatively straightforward. The heart of it is exactly the same. It's a management system. It's documented. It has to have management support. It has to uh, um, uh, has to have properly trained people. But an information security management system is a systematic approach, deals with people, process and technology to protect and manage the whole range of an organization's information. A PIMS, on the other hand, is a British standard, not international standard. It focuses very specifically on the data protection requirements imposed by privacy laws, such as the GDPR and the Data Protection Act uh, 2018. It's a framework for collecting, storing, processing, retaining, and or disposing of personal records relating to individuals. And that's why the combination of the two uh, gives you the best possible approach to your GDPR compliance requirements. How do you go about integrating them? Um, I would say call us, we've done it a number of times, but there are many benefits for integrating your PIMS and your ISMS. The first is the fact that you can demonstrate compliance with the GDPR, uh, stroke Data Protection Act 2018, and other data protection laws that might be relevant. Article 42 of GDPR recognizes that uh, standards are an appropriate way of doing that. Can help you improve the structure and the focus of your data privacy and information security management process while embedding the vital processes in your organization's culture. Remembering there is a requirement under GDPR that you embed data protection by design and by default. Information security, the ISMS requires a risk-based approach to managing information security and that reflects the requirement of GDPR, which is that you apply appropriate measures taking account of the risks there are to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. Continual improvement is built into both management systems and so doing things more efficiently, more systematically should lead to reductions in cost and improvements in process efficiencies, but they do all depend on top management and leadership support and on uh, the involvement of people through the organization to achieve effective privacy and security. So combining a PIMS and an ISMS as I said before, is the very sensible way to deal with it. Hey, there are other options. Um, you could simply wait until you have a breach. So uh, we know that a number of organizations will do that. We've launched a data breach response service, which has three levels to it. The first of which is a um, emergency phone up, uh, pay us uh, quite a large sum of money, um, and we'll start trying to help you sort out what the 
breaches and help you uh, get into a position to work out whether you need to report it. There's the a uh, more practical approach where you uh, give us a retainer uh, that makes you a preferred customer. It gives you preferred rates uh, where you pay only for the amount of time that's necessary to deal with a breach. And then there is the uh, preferred approach, which is to give us a somewhat larger retainer, but where we help you put in place a proper incident response and data breach reporting program. And we're available to handle and manage uh, any breaches uh, as and when they occur. You can find out more by following the link on the slides. The slides will uh, be available to everybody on the webinar, but it's a service offering which is designed uh, through, uh, through IT governance and particularly through our uh, in-house uh, law company, GRCI Law, uh, to enable our clients to have access to really experienced, uh, legally trained data breach response service. We've already, because we provide DPO as a service to a number of clients, we're already dealing quite substantially with organizations who have breaches um, and we're able to help them determine whether a breach is reportable or not. Uh, our experience is that roughly one third of all breaches are reportable, have to go to the ICO. Quite a small number of those also have to go to uh, data subjects. So that gives you a sense of the range. Many of our clients um, have certainly more than one data breach a month. Uh, and that's just because they're paying attention. Uh, most organizations have breaches in that kind of uh, frequency, as I said right at the beginning of this webinar. So um, you could simply, as I said, rely on our data breach support service, uh, which gives you options all the way through from, ah, I've had a, got a problem, I need emergency help, through to proper um, support in setting up incident response and data breach reporting capability, which enables you to deal with challenges as and when they occur. And there are a number of ways that we can help our clients tackle these issues uh, from training, foundation practitioner training on GDPR, lead implementer, auditor training delivered in the classroom online, or through distance learning. Uh, we've got a gap analysis. We can help you with BS 10,012. We've got DPO as a service. And of course, we have a substantial range of staff awareness training courses. Number of free resources available. Um, you can uh, register for our free webinars. There'll be an ongoing series of these and into 2019, you can talk to our experts about how you tackle your compliance project, or you could take our breach ready assessment, which again, you can get to from this link um, and you can take that on our website. It'll give you a, it's quite a simple quick quiz, but it'll give you an assessment of how ready you are to be able to report a data breach. Uh, in the early days, we did have clients who thought that because they scored 60 or 70%, they'd done well. Um, it doesn't, it means you're 30 to 40% not ready to handle a data breach. It's a, uh, an area where 100% is the only mark that's worth having. And ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the end of what I was planning to say. So I'm going to turn now in the time remaining to questions and answers. Um, if you have uh, questions, please do post them in the question function on the um, uh, go to webinar panel. Uh, I'll go through the uh, questions there are. I'll share the question with the audience and then I'll tell you the answer. So will the slide deck be made available to participants? Yes, it will. Uh, it will go out to uh, everybody who is registered uh, sometime in the course of this week, early next week. Where does the DPO's responsibility start and end with regard to personal data breach reporting? References made in GDPR Article 33 to communicating DPO's, DPO's details to the ICO. Presumably, this assumes that it is not the DPO who will be reporting the incident. So does the DPO just need to be involved in the process as an advisor to the controller? Well, if the controller is mandated to have a DPO, then the DPO must be registered with the Information Commission. That's a requirement. How the organization reports the data breach um, is up to the organization, but the data protection officer has to be involved. That's a, again a requirement of the law. And most of our clients deal with that um, either because if they're managing it themselves, their DPO reports it, or if they're using our DPO as a service, we as their DPO report it to the ICO. And we manage all of the aspects of handling the, um, uh, handling the data breach. Um, it's practical to do that because the DPO should be the uh, person who best understands the requirements of how a breach has to be reported and what the issues are. And there is, as I said, a 
requirement in the GDPR, the DPO is involved in the breach reporting process in any case. So for most organizations, just get the DPO to do it. Are data processes readily accepting responsibilities, liabilities, and agreement termination clauses for data breaches? Um, that depends. Um, it depends entirely on the processor controller relationships. Um, it depends on the balance of power between the parties. Uh, so I wouldn't have said this, there was any uniform answer to this. Um, I would say, in fact, that there are many, many circumstances under which controllers and processors are still trying to work out how they have to relate to one another and how those clauses have to be properly set out. And it's one of the areas where having practically minded legal advice can be quite helpful. Um, and it's often the case that in a relationship, an organization might be a controller in respect to some data in that relationship, but could be a processor in relation to other data that's part of that relationship. And teasing that out is an important part of working out how to manage the data within the relationship. So the simple answer is mostly no, um, not being dealt with easily. The processor has 72 hours from discovering the breach to notify the controller, irrespective of the scale or um, severity of the breach. Data processor should report directly to data control or supervisor authority once breach is noticed. So the data processor must report to the data controller. The data processor has a contract with the data controller and that contract should require reporting to the controller by the processor. The controller then has the uh, accountability and responsibility for determining the severity of the breach and deciding whether or not it has to be reported uh, and whether or not it has to be uh, passed on to the data subjects as well. Given the ICO is stretched already, assuming we're not huge organizations, is the ICO liable to engage during a breach scenario or more likely to let the situation play out and retrospectively draw a conclusion about the situation? Um, I can only tell you what uh, what our own experience is. Um, they will engage if you say we have something serious we need to talk to you about. Um, if you think it's simply a reportable but not a serious breach, they're happy for you to deal with that through their online reporting mechanisms. They're likely to come back if the uh, if they think when they come around to look at it, typically uh, one to three weeks later, they may come back and ask for more questions. They may come back and say, thank you, you've already closed it out. We noticed that you've closed it out. So it's clear to us that they're focusing at the moment their efforts on um, inadequately reported breaches and more serious breaches. I uh, can't tell you what it'll be like in six months, but that's kind of how it appears to be right now. Do you know if the ICO publishes breach records anywhere possible so we can educate ourselves further and see the steps taken? Yes, ICO publishes breach records on its website. If you go onto the ICO's website and search for breach reporting and breach records, you'll be able to see um, the uh, records. They produce them uh, typically on a contrary, either quarterly or half yearly basis. And you can see the types of breaches there have been, the severity, and you can see the types of enforcement action the ICO has taken. Uh, so in terms of breaches, specifically quantifying the number of records lost if I lose the name, address, email, and telephone for 20 users, is that 20 records or does each item count as a record, meaning I've lost 80 records relating to 20 people? Um, and that depends uh, on the nature of the records. So if you've got data which on its own uh, can identify a person and uh, so you've got driving license details and you've got passport details. I would tend to think of those as two sets of data about the same person because um, they can be used in different ways. Uh, you might, however, simply treat the fact that you've got the following types of data relating to an individual as meaning that you've got uh, uh, 25 records because it's the records relating to 25 individuals breach. You've got to determine uh, what you're doing and you've got to determine it in a way that makes practical sense so that you can manage data effectively and you can manage data breaches effectively. I think the common meaning of the word record is that it is all of the information which you hold in a record about an individual. But I suspect it's an area that uh, lawyers and judges will argue over for a number of years to come. Uh, 
In a situation where there are joint controllers who have access to the same database, how should they work out whose breach response process or procedure, or which one to use when it becomes necessary? The answer is you have to work that out in advance. The obligation of being a joint controller means you have to decide in advance who's going to do what, and in your privacy notice, you have to set out who's going to do what. So you have to say who's responsible for hosting the data, um, to whom a breach must be reported, who's going to handle it. All of that is part of being transparent in dealing with the data subjects. And you remember that uh, transparency is one of the six data protection principles. Uh, the same thing applies to testing. That's part of determining um, who is going to do what in relation to data. I think we've dealt with the who the data processor reports to, where the number of people affected is high, like British Airways, and they notice it's difficult, which is the best approach, the more they have to do in an action. Um, so the best approach is whatever is going to tell people most quickly, preferably tell them directly, but if there are too many people, the act allows for you to tell them by means of social media, uh, by means of newspaper articles, uh, reports, all of those kind of things. So um, the obligation is to do whatever you can do as quickly as possible to enable data subjects to take avoiding action to protect themselves from the consequences of the breach which they're suffering. We're coming to the end of the time allotted, so folks, I'm afraid that I've really only got time to um, answer one or two more questions and then we're out. Uh, the, let me take this as a question or two questions. The only personal data we process is the first and last names and email addresses. In some instances, we collect payment information, but it goes to third parties and such as PayPal and credit card companies. Should we report a data breach? If you have a data breach, it may be reportable. You have to determine for that data whether the breach is going to create a risk to the rights and freedoms of the people whose breach has been, uh, whose data has been compromised or not. And that's going to depend on the nature of the breach, uh, what's happened to the data, and all of that investigative stuff that I talked about. You're a USA based company. We don't have a supervisory authority. We cannot find anybody who would agree to be our representative in the EU. Um, well, there are services, organizations that provide services such as us uh, to US companies who are providing services into the EU. It is an obligation if you're in the US to have a an EU uh, representative. So um, get hold of us, our GRC law company provides representative services. Um, there are others, appoint a representative. If you're operating without a representative, you're already in breach of the law. And I'm afraid that's it. We're out of time. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's been on the uh, webinar. I hope it's been useful to you. Uh, please do uh, come on to our website. You could find answers to many of the questions which you're, you've got that I haven't had time to answer in any of the material that's available on our website. Some of it in the free materials, some of it in the uh, paid for manuals and pocket guides. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. I hope it's been a useful webinar and good luck with your program to putting in place an effective incident response process. Thank you.